So the next topic is another controversial area in how do we manage people with refractory or difficult to treat AG? Uh, my disclosure, speaker bureau and consultant. Um, so in the next 20 minutes, we wanna cover three objectives. You know, we wanna review the epidemiology and clinical implications of AG and, and our role in, in addressing this major problem. We're gonna discuss the option, treatment option for refractory AG. We're gonna define it and talk about best practices even after a test procedure. So as Jasleen very elegant showed, you know, our, our cohort of people with cirrhosis, it's only getting bigger. You know, I, I remember a couple of years ago, I was in meeting with Ron Bisotel, and he talked about hepatitis C. Oh, we cured hepatitis C. Who's going to get a transplant anymore? And, and no one could have predicted the, the, this epidemic of alcoholism in the United States. No one could have predicted this, this huge you know, onslaught of fatty liver. And today, today in the United States, alcohol is the most common indication for transplantation. And fatty liver is number two. But if you want to stratify data a little closer and look at women, the most common reason for women to be transplanted in the United States is fatty liver. So we're seeing more and more patients with advanced liver disease. I remember when I was a resident at San Diego, you know, 25 years ago, you know, most common admission was heart failure, UTIs, SEPs, blah, blah, blah. Today we're seeing this cirrhosis, you know, as a common reason for admission to the hospital. And once you have hepatic encephalopathy as a complication, it's a revolving door. Get admitted over and over and again. So you guys all know this very well. These are complications of cirrhosis. And, and, and for me, if you look at which one's got the biggest toll on patients and their caregivers, is AG, right? You got someone's got very simply, what do you do? 911. Got ascites, bring them for a paracentesis. Liver cancer, bring them in for RFA, Y90, chemolization. Hepatic encephalopathy is the gift that gives on giving. Once you have symptoms, it's going to happen over and over again. And guess who will take care of Aunt Lucy? Mr. Rodriguez. You know, when, when it's 3 in the morning and they haven't gone to the bathroom, he hasn't taken all his lactose, they're so on their bed. It's your caregivers. If you look at the impact of HGN caregivers, it's enormous. If you look at reasons for bankruptcy in a caregiver, the most common thing is HE. He's told physically, socially, psychologically, economically to caregivers. HE is awful. This, I think, is a beautiful paper published by Elliot Tapper and his colleague from the University of Michigan looking at the epidemiology. And HE is not a benign condition. HE is not a condition you just treat and it goes away. In severe cases, social with worse prognosis. Now, I'm all about be fair and balanced, right? I'm the first to admit no one dies of HE. But for God's sake, if you have severe HE, just woke up back there, I saw you. you know, oh, God's sake, God's sake. It's like church. Um, so if, you know, if someone's got severe HE, you know, grade three, grade four, we're talking about that's a social with increased mortality rate, not a benign condition. Look at their readmission. There's some studies on readmissions. You know, and of course, male scores are predictor readmission, low sodium predictor readmission, HE. Not a benign condition. And don't forget that, that HE also leaves a footprint. Now, what does that mean in English? Facia Conwell was a fellow here 25 years ago. She wrote a paper as a fellow that's not, never talked about. We wrote a paper as a fellow, published in Liver Transplantation. Showing that he said, we got a problem because after transplant, people have some confusion or so, so forgetful. And she found in that paper that the most common reason, most common predictor of problems after transplantation is a history of current HE. It leaves a footprint in severe cases. Anyone know what, what proportion of people go back to work after liver transplantation? Are you gambler ten? No, it's good. This is right. 25%. 75 don't go back to work. Now, there's a lot of reasons, right? 
you know, people have a hot feeling. I'm not going to go back and work at the Walmart, right, or the gas station, the bank, or doctor's office. I want to go travel. If I go back to work, if I lose my insurance, what happens to my medication? But the most common reason is that people have a hard time learning new things. Aging throws people's quality of life um, and associated with mortality. So you've seen this slide a thousand times, and I don't have this memorized. Uh, you know, basically, age comes in different flavors, all the way from the spectrum of having trouble writing your name or adding subtracting to a coma to be tied down. People have personality changes, you know, and be forgetful. I, I love the story. I remember seeing um, this, this doctor, PhD, not MD, PhD at UCLA. And I knock on the, the clinic room, Dr. Jones, like they call it doctor, Dr. Jones. How are you? And this guy was red, 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 mad. Kind of like your sweater. Red, red, red. And I go, my God, why is he so mad? Did he have a high co-payment? Was parking expensive or hard to find? He was mad. And it's a true story. He was mad because the previous two weeks, two car accidents. This guy had an early age and had a horrible response of time. Another patient, true story. You know, I, I knock in the room, Mr. Lopez, how are you? And this guy had his pants off, sitting in the trash can pooping. He thought that he thought the clinic room was a bathroom. Poor guy, right? So, you know, the, the, well, the key for us when you see someone with the HE is what precipitated this? What could we do to, to stop that revolving door? You know, is it due to bleeding? And, and this is old data, but there are some people, and we don't want to talk, we don't like talking about this. But there are some people that are sensitive to protein. When I, when I was a fellow under Joe Pesenia at the VA many years ago, there was a guy, Joe. Joe, you paying attention? Okay, good. Yeah, I, 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 I kept on re being readmitted. I swear to God, every Friday, I thought this guy being, was being poisoned by his wife. It turns out he was going to the pastrami place on Venice Boulevard in Sepulveda, having a huge pastrami sandwich, and it ended up in the hospital afterwards. You know, there's all these precipitants that we have to ask patients about. You know, and in, and in, but the, at the base of this, and Tim Tong loves this, at the base of this is dysbiosis. I love saying the word dysbiosis. So what happens is your gut bacteria changes with cirrhosis, right? Changes. You know, and when you have cirrhosis, you know, you got some shunting. You know, and, 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 and someone who's strong, like, like Shetty, who's muscular, you know, he's got cirrhosis, he's got muscles. He's got muscles. Oh, show him Shetty. <laughs> He's got muscles, and those muscles detoxify toxins like ammonia. So Shetty has a backup mechanism, and the liver has fails, his muscles. But over time, what happens with cirrhosis? They have sarcopenia. And so Shetty's muscles can no longer clean toxins. Anyone know where the word muscles come from? From the word mouse. Yeah, and plus, I guess when you flex your people, plus playing something moving. Mouse. I'm reading this book now on word derivatives. Sorry. 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 All right. What do we have for treat? Lactulose. Has anyone here tried lactulose? Now, Chris, be honest. No, all right. I, I, I don't want to be a hippie because I tried it. Have you tried it, Rush? Oh, my God. Bennett, have you tried lactulose? You must have tried lactose in your career. Never? Oh, my God. I tasted it. It was awful. Oh, my God. This thing coats your mouth, coats your mouth, makes you feel bloated. And it just kills your appetite. And how does it work? It makes you poop. And us as doctors do a horrible job, horrible job. How much time do I have? Oh, good, good. Horrible job in terms of, of instructing people how to take lactulose. I mean, people come to the hospital, you know, we're, we're lucky. We have great nurses. You know, he or she may tell a oh, you know, we haven't had bad one yet, take more lactulose. At home, it's a different story. People come to the clinic either with diarrhea or constipation. They don't know how to take it. Take, you know, 30 cc's twice a day. So we tell our patients, take the first dose in the morning, second dose right before lunch. And you haven't poop, don't take any more. So we got to play with it. But and then we have Zafaxin, Rifaxin. So, so, so can anybody define what is refractory HE? Jasleen, do you know what the refractory HE is? Good. There is no definition. <laughs> so we have great definition for refractory ascites, requiring more than three taps a year. No definition for refractory HE. 
So basically, someone who doesn't respond to therapy, however you want to define that. You know, and, and, and look for precipitant. It's someone who keeps on getting constipated, takes pain medications. You know, look for precipitant. If not, you know, what do you do? Well, we have a number of second-line medications, and people, you're, you, you're pretty comfortable. They're adherent to the first line. And, and, there, and there's no strict guideline. We use neomycin at lunchtime. That works really well. You can use high doses, right? But people go deaf. What? People go deaf. It's aminoglycoside. Dr. Singh talked about a certain class of drugs we can't use in cirrhosis. One are non -seroidos. Second one is aminoglycosides. That's kidney failure. It may cause deafness. We may talk about sodium benzoate. Only one study published sodium benzoate from Mexico. You know, we use it, you know, not very often, but we do use it. People have a factor HE. The, the pharmacy has to make this up, has to create it. Be careful what, but it's sodium benzoate. So it's got sodium in it. So if someone's got a problem with the sodium level, it's going to be an issue. Probiotic. I tell people, remember, from dysbiosis, their bacteria change. So eat Greek yogurt. You're late. Yeah, Greek, Greek yogurt. So eat yogurt at lunchtime. Don't take it in the morning or night. Take it at lunchtime. Greek yogurt. If that doesn't work, right, if they don't respond to that, and most people do, think about a spontaneous spinal renal shunt. Now, I love this topic because HE from spontaneous shunts come, from, come in different flavors. And the flavor that people have refactor HE keep on being remitted over and over and over again. And they come in a different flavor. A Parkinsonium-like behavior. We all learn from mistakes. You know, I got burned a number of years ago. I took over a patient with autoimmune hepatitis, a man, with cirrhosis. And this guy was seeing a psychiatrist for depression for like five years. He wouldn't really look at me, looking down, talk, wouldn't blink his eyes too much, just kind of staring. I, you know, we thought he was depressed. He went to the hospital, did a CT scan for out of what reason? Huge spontaneous shunt. Huge. Embolized it, came back talking like a bird. Blinking his eyes. So when your patients who, who are factory G, you know, people who have a different type of hepatic encephalopathy, you know, uh, a, a Parkinsonian-like type. And it does beg the question, there, there is an unusual H E called uh, hepatocerebral degeneration. The Lenny Goldstein taught me this. And it gets better with L-DOPA. No wonder if that's actually related to spontaneous shunts. So treat spontaneous shunts. So data for spontaneous shunts go back many, many years. And some people have argued that this is a natural mechanism of the liver, of the body, to decompress itself. So people report a potential to have less ascites because you decompress. It comes at a cost. Shunts are, unfortunately, very common. Very common. The question is, which ones are clinically important? This is a paper that got published several years ago that showed that you know, shunts are, uh, were 80 millimeters um, total area. It's highly predictive of HE. When you talk about, about shunts, you got to talk about risk and benefits. If you have someone who's got a refractory ascites already and you shunt them, where's all that blood going? Back into the liver. Increasing portal hypertension. <coughs> How about risk and benefits? But if it's successful, it's very rewarding. Uh, Ed Lee and us published his paper uh, several years ago, um, you know, looking at some new methods, Bartone and Cartel, to embolize shunts, uh, and, and uh, very rewarding in select patients. Um, in the last few minutes, I want to talk about something a little more controversial. Uh, Ed Lee, who's one of our radiologists at UCLA, just published AASOD guidelines on the care people with TIPS. So him and I published uh, this paper a couple of years ago talking about the indications, contraindications for TIPS, um, you know, high male scores, advanced age. You know, nothing scares you more than doing a TIPS when you're over 70 years of age because these individuals tend to have more age as a complication. Uh, after TIPS, is a risk of encephalopathy of at least 40, 50%. 
you know, so the risk factor complications for, you know, include, you know, number of these number of factors. So people can be at risk of, of liver failure and encephalopathy. So we have to be very selective we do TIPS on. Um, and in, and if they do develop TIPS, uh, I'm sorry, encephalopathy, we treat with rifaximin, with lactulose. Um, you know, we might try to buy downsize the TIPS. So a number of options we have. I personally love TIPS. Uh, and, um, and this is a paper, I think we published, we published, showing that, that the previous adage about, about HEP contraindication is not really true. If you have someone who's got controlled HE, uh, you know, TIPS may be safe in select patients. If someone's got brittle HE, they keep on being admitted over and over time, there's a wrong patient. But someone has HE two, three months ago, and they're controlled now, they should do great because after tips, their muscle mass gets big, gets better, and they look like Shetty. <laughs> this is a paper that was published a couple years ago, and, and, and this is the first paper published about something we could do before tips to prevent HG after the procedure. In people who are, who are undergoing a tips procedure, you could protect it from encephalopathy by starting in, by starting with faximin immediately before the tips and continue for a period of time. And this data has reached a new guidelines for the ASOD. The challenge for us, I'll be honest, the challenge for us is to get this drug approved before the tips procedure. A lot of times you make a decision pretty quickly and you have one or two weeks and it's hard to get someone on therapy. And also it's considered off-label because rifaximin is approved for people who have established HE. We still try to do this, and we're successful about 70% of the time. But we'll do anything we can to protect our patient from these complications. Ooh, I made it in time. So, so HE is an important complication of cirrhosis. It should not be considered um, a benign condition. Uh, early recognition and treatment is essential to improve patient-related outcome. Shunting, whether it's spontaneous or iatrogenic or tips, is an important cause of HE. And uh, although H, uh, refractory HE is uncommon, systematic approach will be uh, lead to best of, uh, outcomes. So at this point, thank you for your attention. Uh, and in passive podium to my good friend and colleague, Dr. Akshay Shetty, uh, who's going to talk about another very controversial area about starting and stopping hepatitis B medication. All right, so there you go, Dr. Shetty.